Out of an estimated 1 billion proteins in an average mammalian cell, finding your proteins of interest can be challenging. Imagine you're in a stadium, looking out at the crowd, and you want to know how many people are wearing a blue t-shirt. Thankfully, in the lab, we do have tools that can pick out specific targets within a crowded cell. And we'll show you how scientists use antibodies in a variety of applications to do just that. Back at that concert, how would you find those blue shirts? You'd need a tool that can recognize specific targets with exquisite specificity. You'd need an antibody. Scientists use antibodies to quantify or count the amount of proteins or other small molecules in a sample, capture or bind to specific targets for downstream application, visualize where the antigen is located, and identifying samples based on specific properties. In the lab, there are two main classifications of antibodies that scientists use polyclonal antibodies, and monoclonal antibodies. Polyclonal antibodies are derived directly from animals. Polyclonal antibodies can give a high signal since they'll bind to multiple places on their target antigen. However, the exact composition of polyclonal antibodies varies from batch to batch, and they may be more likely to exhibit off-target binding that is, binding to something other than the target antigen you're interested in. In these cases, you may want to choose a monoclonal antibody. Monoclonal antibodies contain a single antibody that recognizes a single epitope on a target antigen. They're derived from special cell lines or produced from plasmids and are consistent from batch to batch. This higher level of specificity can reduce the background signal but it can also reduce your target signal too. Whatever type of antibody you use, you'll need a way to see it in your experiment. Scientists conjugate their antibody with a reporter molecule, like a fluorescent protein, or an enzyme that makes a particular substrate emit light when they're exposed to each other. This allows the researcher to see the antibody upon reporter activation. Think of these like glow sticks, which can help you see specific areas when you're in the dark. This reporter is often referred to as the antibody conjugate. You can conjugate your primary antibody, the antibody that binds to your target of interest, for direct detection. Or, if you want to amplify your signal, you can leave your primary antibody unconjugated and use a conjugated secondary antibody instead. This secondary antibody targets the FC region of your primary antibody. This is called indirect detection. Since they're usually polyclonal, multiple secondary antibodies can bind to a single primary antibody, and the signal is amplified. This amplification isn't linear, as the number of secondary antibodies that bind to a given primary antibody can vary. Now, let's dig into the different ways to use antibodies we mentioned earlier. The first way is to quantify. Two common assays for quantifying protein in a sample are Western blots and enzyme-linked aminosorbent assays, commonly called ELISAs. ELISAs are a quick, sensitive way to detect a target within a complex mixture. In an ELISA, proteins, lysed from cells, are immobilized on a plastic microplate, either through direct adsorption to the plate or by an antibody already adsorbed to the plate. Once immobilized, the target antigen can be detected with a reporter either directly or indirectly. Some common reporters for ELISA are enzymes, like horseradish peroxidase, HRP, or alkaline phosphatase, AP, as well as other enzymes. These enzymes can react with a substrate to produce a color change, fluorescence, or luminescence that you can measure using a microplate reader. The readout for your sample can be compared to a standard curve generated on the same plate. 
Elias's are highly sensitive assays, and you'll need to be careful not to introduce contamination or technical errors when setting up your plates. They provide quantitative information on the abundance of your protein of interest. A Western blot is a semi-quantifiable method that can provide additional information about the protein, like its size. In a Western blot, lysed and denatured samples are run on an acrylamide gel that enables proteins to be separated by size. The proteins are then transferred from a fragile gel to a more sturdy membrane. In a package known more commonly as a transfer sandwich. Transfer to the membranes also makes the proteins more accessible to antibodies. Most Westerns use the indirect method, so a primary antibody will bind to the targets and then a conjugated secondary antibody will bind to the primary antibodies. Horseradish peroxidase is the most common reporter used in Western blots. Western blots are semi-quantitative, meaning that the samples are quantified relative to each other. Since total protein expression varies sample to sample, you'll need to normalize each sample to its total protein expression, the preferred method, or several ubiquitously expressed so-called housekeeping genes. While you can run a standard curve on a Western block to make it fully quantifiable, there's a very limited number of lanes available compared to the 96 wells available for an ELISA. Since you can only compare samples on the same blot or plate, it's uncommon to run standard curves for Westerns. Let's talk about another way to use antibodies in the lab. To capture. Immunoprecipitation, or IP, uses antibodies attached to beads to capture specific proteins from a mixed sample. In a direct IP, your primary antibody is attached to a small bead, and these antibody-coated beads are added to your cell lysate. As the beads mix and mingle with your lysate, the antibody will bind to your target, forming antibody-antigen complexes. The bead antibody-antigen complexes are then isolated using either magnets or centrifugation. And the antigens are eluded. Indirect IPs are also used, especially when the target may be in low abundance. In an indirect IP, the primary antibody is mixed with the lysate and given time to form antibody-antigen complexes. Then, a bead protein AG complex is added. Protein AG can bind to the FC portion of the antibody, resulting in a bead protein AG primary antibody antigen complex. If your protein of interest is bound to proteins or other molecules, you'll capture the whole complex. If you're interested in identifying these partners, co-IPs are a great approach. The third class of antibody application is visualization. Visualization includes immunocytochemistry, or ICC, which uses antibodies to label targets in a cell culture, and immunohistochemistry, or IHC, which uses antibodies to label targets in a tissue sample. In both techniques, your first step will be to fix your sample, to lock your cells in place. You may also want to permeabilize your sample. This step uses a chemical that creates small holes in the cell membranes, allowing the antibodies to label things inside the cell as well as outside. Both direct and indirect methods are commonly used. It's easy to multiplex an IHC or ICC. That is, target different proteins with different markers and or dyes. Multiplexing can give you precise information about where your target proteins exist in the cell or tissue. And now we've come to the final category of antibody applications, identify. Here, we're talking about flow cytometry and fluorescence activated cell sorting or FACs. They're very similar applications that allow you to identify individual cells in mixed populations. The difference lies in what happens to the cells after they've been identified. In both flow cytometry and FACs, cells are suspended in a liquid media or solution and labeled with a set panel of conjugated antibodies. Each antibody is specific to a target or marker that can help identify a cell. The labeled cells are then flowed one at a time through a path of several lasers. 
The laser reads the fluorescent conjugates on the antibodies and counts and categorizes it into predetermined groups based on which antibodies are bound or not bound to a given cell. Flow cytometry and facts have the exact same data output, but in flow cytometry, cells are discarded after passing through the lasers, and the only output is the data. In facts, labeled cells are physically sorted into a plate or tube for further analysis with downstream application. Flow cytometry and facts are very useful for finding rare cell types in a mixed population of cells. They're very common applications for immunology studies, and they're used in many other fields as well. Both applications typically use direct detection, although indirect detection can be used to amplify the signal when needed. Whew. So many possibilities. And the assays we covered here are just a few of the ways scientists use antibodies in the lab. Antibodies are powerful molecules, not just for your immune system, but for your research too. We've really only scratched the surface of working with antibodies. There are a lot of considerations with every application. If that sounds a little overwhelming, don't worry. AdGene is here to help. Check out AdGene's Antibody Guide, our Antibodies 101 ebook, the AdGene blog, the Antibody Data Hub, and other educational resources to get started. And don't forget to check AdGene's YouTube channel for other videos in our Antibodies 101 series, along with protocols and other good stuff. Or visit us on social media at Blue Sky, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, or TikTok. AdGene, a better way to share science. <laughs>